Good morning, and welcome to worship here at Calvary Episcopal Church in Richmond, Texas. We are delighted that you are worshiping with us this morning. I am a guest myself, the Reverend Canon Joanne Sailors, so I want to welcome anyone else who might be new to the community worshiping with us this morning. I am Canon for Mission of canon for mission amplification here in the diocese of texas i get to work in the bishop's office and work with congregations all around the diocese our service this morning will be the liturgy of the word from holy eucharist right one that begins in a prayer book if you're following along on page 323. our opening hymn will be number 660.
God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ saith, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. be with you and with thy spirit let us pray grant us O Lord not to mind earthly things but to love things heavenly and even now while we are placed among things that are passing away to cleave to those that shall abide through Jesus Christ our Lord who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Spirit one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from Exodus, chapter 16, verses 2 through 15. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If we had only died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them, whether they will follow instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they may bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, in the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. 
And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked into the wilderness and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in saying Psalm 145, verses 1 through 8. I will exalt you, O God, my King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. There is no end to his greatness. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your power. I will ponder the glorious splendor of your majesty and all your marvelous works. They shall speak of the might of your wondrous acts and I will tell of your greatness. They shall publish the remembrance of your great goodness. They shall sing of your righteous deeds. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great kindness. A reading from Paul's letter to the Philippians. To me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing. For he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but to suffering for him as well, since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus said, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner, who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. 
And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Here's another way to tell the story. The kingdom of heaven is like a manager at an online retailer who was opening a new warehouse and needed some workers. So on Monday, he pulled applications from his job fair database and found some likely candidates. He offered to pay them $1,000 for a 40-hour work week, and the workers gladly agreed. On Tuesday morning, he went back to his database and hired some more workers. On Wednesday morning, he hired some more. Thursday and Friday, he hired even more workers, the ones no one had yet hired either. He promised all of them a fair wage. When quitting time came on Friday, he told the foreman to pay the newest workers first and the ones hired on Monday last. When the people hired Friday morning looked at their paychecks, they jumped and whooped and celebrated because they had been paid $1,000 for one day's work. When the workers hired Monday saw this, they started figuring that they would get paid a lot more because they had worked all week. Let's see, that comes to $5,000 a week, or $20,000 a month, or $250,000 a year. After all, they had been there first, and they were the ones who trained those new workers. But when they got their paychecks, they were still $1,000, or $4,000 a month, a measly $50,000 a year. So the group hired on Monday decided to go talk to the manager. And they said, you know what, look here, we worked here five days for you, and these new folks, the deadbeats who worked only one day, got paid the same as we did. It isn't fair that they should get the same pay that we did. And the manager just said to them, look, I'm not doing anything to hurt you. I paid you what you agreed to when you were hired. Take your pay and go home. I'm in charge here, and I can pay people whatever I want to. So are you really going to be that stingy just because I want to be generous in paying the others? It's my factory, and if I want the first to be last and the last to be first, so be it. Now, this is a strange enough story in Matthew's Gospel, but if you put it in modern terms, it's almost too strange for us to understand. Pretty much everyone working in a factory today, not just those angry workers, would find some issue with how the story plays out. The finance people would certainly be disappointed in the owner's behavior. It's important to keep costs in line, after all. You want to keep expenses in line with budget to keep your shareholders happy and pay what it takes to return, retain your high-performing employees. The legal department would also cringe. Thinking in terms of the Fair Labor Standards Act and requirements for overtime pay, one group of employees is making a lot more money for the same work, and a 500% disparity for comparable work would almost certainly lead to some sort of discrimination lawsuit. The HR department would have to find time to prepare a conflict resolution seminar and training for the other managers in the company on how to avoid this type of situation that the the manager created here. It just leads to long-term employee relations problems when you let your workers get that mad. And shouldn't HR be taking the lead anyway so that the proper procedures are followed when we hire people and the right paperwork gets filled out? Okay, so maybe I'm projecting a little. 
Usually when I hear this story, whether in its biblical form or a modern retelling, I find myself taking the point of the view of those workers hired at the beginning. That's not fair. Darn it, there should be some reward for showing up earliest, working the hardest, being the best, shouldn't there? And the last shall be first? That's ridiculous. Why would you reward the slackers? Shouldn't the millennials have to work their way up the same way I did? Should those who come in late and take a million breaks all day really get paid for the whole day? But then I get over myself a little bit and remind myself that, the partici that participation in the kingdom of heaven isn't based on how hard or how long we work. I mean, that's an issue that was supposed to have been resolved in about the 16th century, after all. And none of us is as good as we think we are anyway. We've all fallen pretty short of being the kind of worker that God calls us to be. Now, I've heard a lot of sermons preach that lesson, as well as the lesson that our unfortunately human tendency toward greed and competition doesn't really work in God's household and just serves to make us miserable rather than joyful. Good lessons, but I'm sure those are lessons you already knew. Sometimes I've heard the story called the parable of the generous employer instead of the parable of the workers in the vineyard. Described that way, the focus of the parable shifts away from the attitude of the workers to the employer's ridiculous, abundant generosity. And the point of the story seems to be that no matter how late you are in responding to God's call to relationship through Jesus Christ, God is still faithfully waiting to welcome you. The parable becomes pure allegory. It's about some group, say the people of Israel, as the early workers, and another group, the latecomer Christian church, as the second. In any event, all those who respond to God early or late are treated not just fairly, but abundantly. And the parable, like the parable of the prodigal son, is the story of the inbreaking of God's grace into our lives, a gift freely given to anyone who opens himself or herself up to receive it. Again, a good message, and one you probably already knew. Any of those messages work pretty well for those of us who are relatively affluent and relatively powerful. Those latecomers didn't work as much as we did, but God doesn't pay on those terms, and we should recognize and be glad for that. God wants to give generously to all of us, no matter who we are, and those of us who have been in church for a while should welcome those come later. But here's the thing. If we're not careful those messages can come off a little self-righteous, not really shaking us out of our place of affluence and power. They can subtly send the message that we, the hard workers, the religious veterans, are still in some position of moral and cultural superiority, and we just need to be kind enough to let others in with us. This parable, though, challenges us to go further outside our comfort zone than that. I wonder, why is it we are not so inclined to look at the parable from the perspective of the workers hired last? The workers who began nearly at the end of the workday and who said they had no work because no one offered them a job. Imagine waking up early and going to the marketplace before six o'clock in the morning, hoping for work, knowing that you need a full day's wage, knowing that your family is counting on you to bring home the barest of living wages. You aren't chosen at six or again at nine. Maybe you're smaller, maybe you're older, maybe you're pregnant. Something about you makes you seem weaker or slower than those hired ahead of you not worth the risk. And then you aren't picked at noon or even at three in the afternoon, but you still need that full day's wage. Just imagine that you are the one who has waited in vain throughout the whole day, knowing that you and your family are desperate and needy. 
You realize that you would stand idle and useless all day were it not for the benevolence of the landowner. Imagine your relief at being told at five o'clock that there is work for you. You don't even ask what the earnings will be. You're desperate and trusting and just glad the day will not be entirely wasted. Even one-twelfth of a day's full wage will help feed the family. You can at least take that home to prove that you care for those who are counting on you. And then imagine lining up to obtain your pay. But you receive a full day's wage instead of just the hour of wage you expected. Imagine the extravagance of that, how that must feel, a full day's wage. Imagine how heavy it might feel in your hand. Imagine how immense is your thankfulness for a master who doesn't play by the rules, but whose generosity overflows. Imagine your gratefulness. When we put ourselves into the parable as that desperate, needy worker, overcome by the generosity of an employer who pays us what we need, not what we've earned, we realize what a challenge the message really is. The story becomes what theologian Jose David Rodriguez calls the parable of the affirmative action employer, one who is generous and full of sympathy for the poor. As Rodriguez says, the parable does not provide us with a description of someone who's willing to give equal opportunity to people provided they show the same number of credentials, the same resume, or the same experience. The story describes an employer whose criteria go beyond merit to focus on need. As it turns out, this parable isn't just about the generosity of the landowner. It really is about us, too. But it's not simply a rebuke of greed and competitiveness in the lives we're already living. Instead, it's a challenge to us to allow ourselves to be transformed and to live differently. It asks us to practice as a church, as a community, the same kind of justice practiced in God's kingdom, a justice beyond legal regulations and human merit. The God who welcomes all, early and latecomer, rich and poor, into the church is the same one who provides generously for all the people in the marketplace or the database. So instead of worrying about the fairness of paying the late arriving workers more, might we worry instead about the fairness of a system where they nearly don't get hired at all? Can we take the absurdity of the last being first and the first being last as a call to stop using our own definitions of merit to decide who is first and last? and look instead at how we should be helping the most vulnerable of our neighbors? And then might we tr base our help on what our neighbors truly need, not on we decide, what we decide they should have? Could we practice God's affirmative action? Amen.
I invite you to join me in a statement of faith as expressed in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In peace we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble, we pray especially for the men and women of our armed forces at home and abroad, that they may have a sense of your abiding presence wherever they may be. For those, for those who, who minister, minister to, to the sick, the, the friendless, and, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all, for all who, who proclaim, proclaim the gospel and all, and all who, who seek, seek the, truth. the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop, Andy, Jeff, Kay, and Hector, our bishops, and the people of Calvary Church. For all who serve God in his church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. We pray for those who are ill, especially Maria Alvarez, Sandy Bachman, Sammy Bogosi, the Bennett family, the Campbell family, Ruth Carroll, Jessica Sheriff, Kate Klingenpeel, Millie Cordero, Jordan and Michael Crow, Paige Dean, the Dunn family, Lois Asells, Celeste Good, Wendell Holbert, Reverend Scotty Innocent family, Peter and Mary Claire Horgan, Susie Hugley, James Iverson, Ginger Jackson, Joanne Ketchmark, Dorothy Lyons, Mike McClellan, Charlie McLemore, Julon Morris, Sandra Miggy, Kelly Murley, Butch Oliver, Jan Ritchie, Joy Robertson, Barbara Shorey, Richard Shorey, the Stacy family, Lisa Trailer, Ranty Valdez, Debbie Werner, and those we now name silently or aloud. Hear us, Lord. For, for your mercy, mercy is great. great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and, and praise, praise your name forever and ever. And ever. We pray for all who have died that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. We especially pray for those we now name silently or aloud. Lord, 
Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Who put their trust in you. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against thee in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved thee with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of thy son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in thy will and walk in thy ways to the glory of thy name. Amen. Almighty God, our heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Alleluia! Alleluia! Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia! Alleluia!